New discoveries on Fatima, the third secret, and Sister Lucia Dos Santos. A conversation with Dr. Peter Hoynowski, founder of Sister Lucy Truth. We at Sister Lucy Truth, publicly declare that based on the evidence presented here, we have found it to be morally and scientifically certain that the woman portrayed to the world as Sister Lucy, from her first public appearance on May 13, 1967, to her death on February 13, 2005, was not the same person as Sister Lucy, seer of Fatima and visionary who predicted the miracle of the sun on October 13, 1917. This, one of the greatest frauds in the history of the Church, was discovered through the use of the most sophisticated facial recognition programs available, along with the accumulated testimony of plastic surgeons, orthodontists, forensic artists, private investigators, handwriting analysts, and facial recognition experts. Due to the availability of hundreds of photos of Sister Lucy on the internet and in authoritative biographies, this case of substitution, fraud, and stolen identity has been able to be uncovered and analyzed. Without the judgment of the best and most relevant professionals available, we would not be making this grave accusation and presenting this charge. We will continue to accumulate and post on this site new studies and research concerning this investigation as they are produced and published. All of the names of the relevant experts shall be published along with their professional findings. The truth of the disappearance of the true Sister Lucy and the identity of the imposter who took her place shall be placed before an internationally based private investigator who will investigate and solve the case. The fraud has been identified and named. We charge the highest officials in the Vatican with conspiracy to perpetuate and conceal the substitution of Sister Lucy dos Santos of Fatima with an as yet, unknown imposter. See our investigation at sisterlucytruth.org. Hello, my name is Edwin Young, and here today we're going to talk about Fatima with some new insights given to us by Dr. Hoynowski. All right, thank you for having me, and I look forward to getting into some things that we're dealing with with regard to Sister Lucy Truth and our investigation, and I look forward to our conversation. All right, our first question. Doctor, how exactly did you get involved with the whole topic of Fatima? Well, I've been involved with Fatima since I joined the Blue Army back in the 70s and uh, as a child and uh, have been very devoted to Our Lady of Fatima. And then in about the year 2000, I became involved with uh, Father Gruner and uh, the Fatima Center. And so we went around the world basically uh, speaking about Fatima and uh, as I got into the miracle of the sun and the whole question, the, you know, the reality of the message of Fatima, Sister Lucy, then I came to the point in uh, 2015 where through various websites, it was pointed out that there seems to be a problem between, um, with regard to the identity of Sister Lucy after uh, 1960. And you know, some people at some websites had presented the pictures and I talked about it with some of my friends at the Fatima Center and they said, well, there does seem to be a difference, some difference, there appears to be a problem, but you have to prove it scientifically exactly. if there is a problem. So I said, well, maybe there's a problem, maybe there isn't, but um, let's take up this question of uh, using sci the latest scientific means available to see whether there was any uh, imposter uh, put into the place of the real Sister Lucy, and then think about how it affects our understanding of Fatima and the message of Fatima and what happened with regard to the whole third secret and everything yeah. that followed. What's the purpose exactly of Sister Lucy Truth? The purpose of Sister Lucy Truth is to do two things, to find out whether 
There, a woman was put in the place of the real Sister Lucy, and we don't, at least prior to 1967. And then after we use all the available scientific means for determining whether there was an imposter, then trying to you know, initiate an investigation into what happened to the real Sister Lucy and who was the imposter put in her place. Uh, that's simply put, that's what we're interested in. And uh, we have been pursuing that task for the last three years. And uh, we've been fairly successful in what we've achieved so far. So when exactly did you become aware that there was a minor or major possibility yeah. that there is an imposter put in place? Right. Well, in I think it was 2016, I became aware of the um, uh, Marion Horvat did a presentation on the Tradition and Action site website where she put the, some of the various pictures and angles from the Sister Lucy prior to 1960 and then the pictures of what should have been Sister Lucy after 1960 and to me just intuitively there appeared to be a clear difference and of course uh, Dr. Horvat indicates that in her mind there was a difference and I saw this as so important because how can we understand the whole Fatima message and the Fatima idea and you know the question of the third secret and uh, what it refers to how can we understand that unless we make a judgment and find out in a definitive way whether there was someone else put in the place of Sister Lucy. Uh, it, it's sort of a mind-boggling task and if there was an imposture then that should affect our whole view of the Fatima message, the third secret, Sister Lucy herself and everything she said uh, after 1960 and also how it fits into the whole question of the church and what's happened to the church since uh, 1960, Vatican II, and everything after that. It all fits together. And if we can approach it, what I hope to do is approach this whole question in a very scientific way, a very objective way. That's why I'm not the investigator. I've just sort of commissioned these various, you know, experts to investigate this whole question and both with regard to identification and with regard to any possible follow-up of the identification. Um, so this is an ongoing task and you know we really got our first report based on facial recognition technology way back in um, 2018. That was the first time we had a definitive report that said the woman prior to 1960 was different from the woman who appeared post-1960. And the facial recognition report said that clearly. And so that's the first report that we had that there was uh, two different women involved in this whole, this whole Sister Lucy case. And uh, since then, we've had report after report that have, has confirmed the initial finding. Ongoing, I mean, we've just commissioned a report. I just commissioned a report yesterday uh, from another forensic uh, agency that works with the US government to try to get another report on this question. So it's an ongoing task, but we've gotten an incredible amount of information so far from a whole range of different experts on the topic whether, you know, surgeons or dentists or the latest facial recognition programs, even handwriting specialists, we brought into the whole question and to analyze the written work of, you know, Sister Lucy pre-1960, Sister Lucy post-1960. So that's where we are, Eddie, and that's, and that's where we're going still. You say you have 
a lot of reports, yes. and facial recognition yes. reports, yes. handwriting yes. specialists, yes. and we, even despite all that, for the people that don't exactly, or that aren't open to sure. looking at this sure. sort of way of viewing things, sure. what concrete evidence do you have exactly? Well, we're trying to get the best. We're trying to get the best of those who are experts in this particular area, facial recognition, forensic artists. And I'd like just to mention one that comes to mind, and that's Lois Gibson. I mean, she's she's been um, in the Guinness Book of World Records for identifying the most criminals based on her um, facial uh, forensic art and reconstructions. And she was also trained in dentistry and uh, facial reconstruction and um, we gave her all the evidence and she came back with a definitive report that these were definitely two different women that it would be it was impossible that they were the same woman and this really struck us as you know say it's impossible that's that's shocking in a way but because it showed it indicates that there was this imposture and but for those people, I say, we, you have to give us a chance. You have to, you know, we're not, we want to avoid placing this, making this a theological discussion, a theological argument. We want to look at the scientific evidence. And the only way we can do it is through uh, the facial recognition, through the pictures, experts analyzing the pictures you know for example maxillofacial surgeons looking at the pictures and saying well this particular structure of the face and doesn't line up with the other you know the earlier woman so therefore they have to be two different people of course once we finish all the forensic work and once we get all the reports that we're looking to get well, then we have to go to the DNA and look for the DNA because that, along with the pictures, will produce an de absolutely definitive result. And then, you know, then the interesting part comes. If, if we find that they are definitely two different people, well, then what happened? And who's going to give us some an answers? And, you know, then it, it's in the hands of the investigators to find out what really happened what happened to the real sister lucy yeah. and um who was this woman put in her place mm -hmm. all right um now when you have someone like a specialist such as lois gibson yes uh, clearly stating that oh there's no way that these two people could be the same yes same individual yes where are you exactly in the investigation why hasn't exa it exactly stopped there Right. Well, you'd think it would stop there and with these others because we have plastic surgeons and other reports that, you know, clearly identify that these are two different people, plus the facial recognition technology that's used by the FBI, you know, the police departments all over the country. Now we, we're putting everything together and handing it over to some forensic specialists and they're gonna they're gonna come up with another report. They're getting what they need, and um, looking at the evidence. Once we do that, then we're going to take it as we've done everything we can with the latest technology, and uh, then it's a matter of putting this information on the internet, making it uh, sort of bringing the whole question to the mainstream media, because that's where. Ultimately, we want to get it to, of course, we've sort of penetrated the various Catholic uh, sites and publications, but t t uh, I find it concerning and perplexing that more people, once we presented this evidence, because Eddie, all this evidence is on the internet. I mean, we've, every time we've gotten a report, no matter what it said, we've put it on the internet and put it out there for anyone to view at any time. And, you know, ask us questions about it and publish the, you know, the, the resumes of all the specialists and 
But what's what's concerning to me is that rather than just look at it objectively, many people look at it subjectively and from the sort of a combative stance where you're looking at it as a member of a group, this group or that group. Well, what about the facts? Where do the facts point? And we can read it in our own way based on our own understanding and our own faith and theological outlook. But let's look at the facts and see what are the consequences of those facts. Where, where does it lead us? And um, I challenge anyone to look at our evidence on sisterlucytruth.org. Make a judgment or, you know, even open up the question because that's all we're asking people to do is look at, think about the question and what are the implications if there is an imposter who has been, who was put in her place, what are the implications? What other questions does that bring up? And how is the Vatican going to respond to this? And, you know, the Carmel at Coimbra and even some, to somewhat degree, Opus Dei, the Opus Dei organization, because the nuns at Coimbra are uh, cooperators with Opus Dei. So they have some questions that have to be answered. But I think the easiest, the easiest way of approaching all this information is silence. Just, you know, the shroud of silence that is covering us now. But we're not going to be silent. And with our friends here and with yourself, we, we want to get this information out because it's critical. It's critical to understand what happened to her because if we can't understand what happened to Sister Lucy, then how do we understand Fatima? How are we to understand everything that she supposedly said after 1960? Because the, the imposter, who I, the woman that I believe now is an imposter based on what we've seen, she really performed a certain role and they didn't just put an imposter there for no reason whatsoever. She was to follow a certain line and she followed that line. And I think that if the evidence clearly points there being an imposter, then we have to, have to ask ourselves, well, why was there an imposter put in in the first place? And what, what, what did they intend her to do? Why not just say, Sister Lucy had died and that be the end of it. Why put it in imposter? It's to create a false narrative, really. And, and the question is, what is that false narrative? And, and what did they want us to believe? And what should we then question as we look at the case based on the results that Sister Lucy Truth has discovered? When it comes to the case, you, you have a lot of evidence on your side and you have a lot of forensic reports that sure. clearly state from experts that there's no way that these two people could be the same. Sure. Why is it important one should look at this information and not take it so lightly? Well, it, if it is true, and we did not go into this saying that there was an imposter sister Lucy, Obviously, we wouldn't have even had started the whole process if we just had an agenda and, you know, we obviously had to see that there was some problem. If we didn't see any problem, of course, we wouldn't have started this because it's a lot of work. Exactly. It's a lot of paperwork, filing, IRS, bank accounts, you know, and contacting donors and potential donors. So it's a lot of work and a lot of time spent but um so obviously there was some problem that we saw but what we weren't sort of expecting was the definitiveness of the reports i mean we've had reports which really based on biology and uh you know the the configuration the face and the whole the dynamics there uh and using even mathematics that we've report after report 
has shown that these cannot be the same person. And if they're not the same person, and yet this woman was called Sister Lucy, and she's actually up for beatification and canonization. If she wasn't the real Sister Lucy, then we have the, biggest, the most important and really shocking case of identity theft in the whole history of the world, I think. Exactly. Because yeah. if, if we take Fatima seriously, if this woman, because the, the other two seers of Fatima, Jacinta and Francisco, well, they died 1919 and 1920. Lucia was supposed to be the seer, the messenger of Our Lady, who brought forward all of the Fatima message to the world and to proclaim it, and even to proclaim the third secret to the world and let that be known. If, if there was a substitute and she disappeared, well, then we have the, not only the greatest case of identity fraud in the whole history of the Catholic Church, and I would say the whole history of the world, because that's the importance that Fatima has for the world. But um, we have a potential case of murder, of kidnapping. That's serious business. And that so many people who say they're involved in the whole attempt to get the Fatima message out, that so many people ignore this, to me, is shocking. Because the implications are so profound, surely you can even raise the issue. But when many of them, for example, Taylor Marshall, has raised the issue, it's been to just dismiss it as, as an absurd. Well, no one who looks at our information, I, even who looks at the pictures, would ever say it's absurd. It's not absurd. In fact, it's a serious question. Once it gets out, it will reverberate throughout the world and it will shake the world, it will shake the Vatican, and that's what has to happen. Now, what exactly do you think could have happened to the real Sierra Fatima, the real Sister Lucy? You say they're trying to push yeah. a false narrative. Yes. But what, what exactly happened? could have happened? Yeah. Hiding her away and putting someone else in her place or she died and you substituted someone else to hijack the Fatima message, which is what would have happened. Or if she was murdered, then you have a grave situation and you have a situation that I think even touches the supernatural level because <laughs> Our Lady let this happen. Our Lady, our Lord allowed it for a reason but he allowed it, and the evil involved in getting rid of the real Sister Lucy must have been deep and profound and reached to the, if you will, the lowest level. <laughs> I was gonna say the highest level, but it's really the lowest level because um, something, at this point, we're pretty confident that something happened to her and um, whatever. But also I'll say this, that if it happened, the highest levels of the Vatican were certainly involved. Anyone who knows the Catholic Church, anyone who knows how things operate, and anyone knows who knows the importance of that woman, Sister Lucy Dos Santos, knows that the highest levels of the Vatican had to be involved. And I think everyone knows who I'm talking about. Right, John the 23rd and Paul the 6th, because it was under Paul the 6th that the imposter apparently first appeared in 1967, and then even her reappearance in 1982, when she was visited by John Paul II. Um, those are important people, and they were apparently involved in this imposture and they presented the imposture to the world as legitimate. And that's a crime. That's a crime. I mean, we call it with this nice word, word identity theft, as if I've just stolen your wallet, you know, but this is identity theft to the highest degree because it's hijacking not only the, the persona of Sister Lucy, but the Fatima message and also no doubt the third secret of Fatima, 
which the real sister Lucy wasn't able to affirm, right? So they could put forward anything and have it accepted by the imposter because she apparently was working for them. <laughs> Not for it. God <laughs> or, or, or the Blessed Virgin Mary. You say the highest level of Vatican, they're certainly questionable when it comes to this whole case of identity fraud. Are there any other prime suspects? Well, I wonder about Opus Dei's involvement. Um, uh, Father Escriva, Jose Maria Escriva, went out of his way, even in the 1970s, when apparent, when Sister Lucy was long gone, the real Sister Lucy, apparently was long gone. He went out of his way to, I, to say that it was Sister Lucy of Fatima that encouraged him to come into Portugal, to bring Opus Dei into Portugal, as if she gave the Opus Dei organization her stamp of approval. So, so and if these nuns in Coimbra, uh, in Portugal, if the Carmelites are cooperators with Opus Dei. There's no doubt in my mind that they were somehow, Opus Dei was somehow involved in uh, the switch, uh, the change be between the real one and the imposter. They would have to be involved. The vat, they couldn't be ignored. So they have a lot of questions to uh, answer. And let me just, Eddie, if I can just emphasize this too, is that all these people, the prime suspects, have all been canonized by, you know, uh, Vatican II Church recently. Jose Maria Escriva, John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul the 2nd, they've all been canonized. Well, if they did this to Sister Lucy, they're not saints. So what are the implications of that for the world? There's a lot of other reasons why they're not saints, but that would be a big reason why they couldn't be saints. So do you see the importance of this issue? Uh, just, it's unbelievable. And all you need is, a, is some, you know, scientific reports from objective uh, professionals who have no problem looking at the information generally. This okay. This is the case. We analyze according to our specialty. Uh, we, here's here's your report, and you know this is what we think, and do with it what you want. And um, so it's it's sort of easy in a way to I to analyze this material because there's plenty of pictures. There's hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Yeah. And now video also. We have a video which your father I know has, has taken apart and, and you know has so many uh, screenshots of it and he's done ma amazing things to bring forward this information. Uh, so we have video of the real Sister Lucy in 1946 returning to Fatima. And this is all, all our material basically comes from the Fatima shrine. You know, it comes from the books that have been produced by the sisters of Coimbra. So we're not making up, or, or the newspapers in 1967, you know, that were published. Um, we're not making up the, these pictures. We're not making up this information. We're also not making up the, the handwriting samples. These are all things produced by the, the Carmel at Coimbra, but put forward to the public. That we've that we've had our handwriting experts analyze, and nothing from 1960 on has ever uh, cohered with the writings of the Sister Lucy from the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. They've all been forgeries. The letters that we've looked at, that we've submitted to handwriting analysis, they've come back as cleverly orchestrated. Of forgeries cleverly done so this means that there was an intent this means there was a plot and it's, it was very sophisticated and it's sort of hard to 
You know, when we see Fatima, you know, we think of devotions and, you know, the basic message, but there's a whole international plot to falsify Fatima and falsify the persona of Sister Lucy. It's grave. And, um, you know, we Sister Lucy Truth, we feel extremely inadequate. We don't, we don't feel adequate to deal with this whole thing because who are we? But we have to do it. It just the task itself demands that it be done. And uh, if Our Lady wants to use us, well then, so be it. No one else is looking at it from a scientific persp exactly. uh, perspective. It's all personal observation, which is fine, but it has to be dealt with using the mo most modern scientific means of analyzing these photos and this hand these handwriting samples. So if anyone wants to see the information, the information's there. And it, we have, I mean, wherever anyone could forward this topic on social media with their friends, with their family, I mean, you put it, you put the pictures in front of even children, and people of all ages, people that, who haven't even thought of the issue. Put the pictures to them. Intuitively, they say, there's something going on here. There's something that just seems wrong. And we think there is. Now, with all that said, um, yeah. for those that actually would really like justice for the real system, yes. Lucy, what exactly could someone do to help well, to support your cause? Well, I hate to say it, but we need as, as many donations as we can get because we're pretty much operating on a shoestring uh, budget and um, there's the forensic specialists that, you know, charge fees for their time. And it's quite expensive. And uh, just for the time spent and the e experts that they have to bring in. And then once we get all the reports, then we want to get boots on the ground, you know, in Europe and Portugal. And to try to get the DNA, try to find out what happened here. If there's a problem, what happened? And also to just make this available to the public, like produce a movie. This would be a great movie. Where are where are our movie makers? This is the greatest show, <laughs> one of the greatest shows potentially that could ever come forward. I mean, Dan Brown has nothing on this stuff. You know, this is this is if it's true that there was an imposter, it'd be an incredible conspiracy because you see the videos, for example, of the, in 2005, you know, the, de the death of what the person who everyone thought was Sister Lucy, which we believe now was not the real Sister Lucy. I mean, there was tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people at her funeral. And it was a national day of mourning for in Portugal. And many people apparently were deceived. And we were deceived. I was deceived for many yeah. years. Um, during my time at the Fatima, with, working with the Fatima Center, not once did I ever hear about a uh, imposter sister Lucy. Not once. It's about time we pursue this, and it's about time the Vatican come up with some answers. Because, uh, in his I mean, Joseph Ratzinger, if you're out there, <laughs> you know the truth, and you, you're, you're on your deathbed, we're close to it, so come forward with the truth. The truth about the apparent substitution of Sister Lucy, the hijacking of the message of Fatima, come forward. This is grave matter. This is grave matter that affects the whole world. How can you not only go along with the taking out of the messenger of 
Fatima, the seer of Fatima, who saw the miracle of the sun, who predicted two ta three times the miracle of the sun, and then it happened. How can you just stay there, knowing that this has happened, knowing that her persona has been hijacked, and that the message of Fatima has been totally hijacked, and basically the message of the third secret has been falsified because everyone knows that is absolutely absurd that this third secret which was supposed to be revealed in 1960 because it would be clear as to what's going on and what the message is about why that secret should refer to an assassination attempt in 1981 21 years later it's absurd exactly. so the whole Vatican interpretation of third secret is absurd. If the real Sister Lucy were alive at that point, she would never go along with this falsification. She would never go along with it. And yet how many go along with this? And what is the third secret about? Maybe it's about... <laughs> it's about a church that would falsify the identity of the real Sister Lucy. <laughs> and other things. Maybe it's about that. Maybe. Could be. That would, that would explain the substitution and the reasons for it. Because there's got to be a reason. Serious reason. Because, you know, they started, they started the deception early on. They have pictures and, and we, didn't we didn't come to this knowledge. Um, a plastic surgeon who was looking at the pictures uh, told us about it and said the pictures from 1960 are clearly, you know, if you will, cut and paste. The lighting is totally wrong here. The, the pictures of Sister Lucy appearing right next to Paul VI in, on May 13, 1967, many of those were cut and paste. Many of those were total distortions and there was really a camera there and Yet Sister Lucy is put in, her, in the place of the camera, just sort of... And this was long before they had the technology of doing it. It was a very primitive presentation. But those pictures came out in June of 1967 in the newspapers that dealt with Fatima in Portugal. Uh, the Voice of Fatima, I believe it was. And so, so only a few weeks after the event, they were already putting forged, uh, adapted photographs forward as if these were real photographs of the two together. And um, so the plot was pretty deep early on and they were serious you know, a long time ago about this, this whole thing. And it's, who could do this? Uh, what was involved? Again, it's it's the bit. It should be a movie, and uh, but it's a fact. And all we're trying to do is present facts. And you can read those facts any way you like. You can draw the implications, but please look at the facts and make a judgment. Human beings are made by God to make judgments based on what they know. You take what appears, what things look like, and then. The, uh, your ideas and then, you know, the universal ideas and you put them together to make judgments. And we really need to make judgments because these judgments are critical. I mean, we sort of have a scientific proof. We're getting scientific proof that there was a huge um, break between what was going on before 1960 and what's going on after 1960 in the Catholic Church. And the Sister Lucy case really focuses on that because that, she, her, her substitution is sort of a sign of, a diff, of another substitution substituting a different church for the old church, just like they substituted a new Sister Lucy, totally different outlook, totally different looks also, for the old Sister Lucy. And if you look at the pictures, Eddie, if you look at the pictures, 
pre-1960 and then post, there's a, different, there's a different sort of atmosphere surrounding the two women. And I challenge anyone to say that's not the case. And I'm not talking about the mathematical differences between the eyes and the, you know, the space between the eyes. And I'm talking about the whole, because that's there too. Yeah. But, but just the whole atmosphere, one has a very pious, sort of subdued atmosphere, very somber, but also capable of joy because many of the pictures of her uh, visit to Fatima shows that there's this innocent joy that just exudes from her person and her, her expressions. And then we see the new one who's, who's very sociable, uh, used to the camera, and where the old one clearly wasn't, the real one apparently clearly wasn't. And, uh, but the new one's very, enjoys the camera, uh, is very social and enjoys crowds, and even says in her videos that were made in the, in the 1990s that, you know, when she goes out, everyone comes to kiss her, and there's some amazing things that this new, this new one said. And, um, so, and the whole atmosphere is different. It's, it's not a pious atmosphere. It's a very sort of worldly, secular, almost superficial atmosphere where no one who looks at the pictures of the pre-1960 Lucy would ever identify a superficial atmosphere. No one. It's just a totally different aspect to her as compared to the new one. So, do you think the replacement of the real Sierra Fatima, Sister Lucy, do you think that parallels at all the, the changing of the Catholic Church? Well, yeah, you've, you've run in, you've touched on something incredibly important because, um, you know, the, in the last interview, in the last interview of Sister Lucy that we know of uh, in 1957, December 26th, uh, 1957 with Father Fuentes, uh, Sister Lucy says that there, this was the final battle. This was, we were coming towards the final battle between Lucifer and uh, Our Lady, you know, and God and, and the devil. And that we were in the midst of this and our tools, if you would, uh, were the rosary and devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And she also said something interesting is that you we're not going to be able to count on the Pope and the bishops and the clergy and the religious to tell us to do follow, you know, the message of Fatima and to do penance and prayer. So she clearly saw that there was going to be a huge problem. And and then according to our information she, that woman, disappeared, and she was gone. And then, it's very interesting, 1959, John the 23rd read the third secret, famously said, this is not for my pontificate. You know, well, why not? It was supposed to be, you know, if you're 1960 Pope, um, it's supposed to be, but uh, he said it's not for my pontificate. And then he said something very interesting. On October 11th, Feast of the Divine Maternity, in 1962, when he opened the Vatican Council, he said, Second Vatican Council, he, he spoke against the prophets of doom and instead said, you know, we're tired of their naysaying and their predictions of apocalyptic events. We're tired, we're, not, we're putting that aside and we're taking up this cheery, uh, positive view of the world and of modern men. And that's what we're gonna emphasize. And we're gonna sort of make that the governing vision of the Catholic Church, this, this positive view of men, rather than sort of the apocalyptic warnings that were made by these prophets of doom. Now, who in the world could be the prophets of doom unless it's Sister Lucy of Fatima, 
the children of Fatima and Our Lady at Fatima. And, you know, the, the real message of Fatima, speaking about the falling of the world into sin and I think into apostasy. Now, the new sister Lucy, if you look at her, she went along with and endorsed, not just went along with, but explicitly endorsed all the modernist innovations that, uh, that affected the church after 1960. For example, the changing of doctrine, right? Ah. Uh, Sister Lucy never once complained or said anything against nothing against John the 23rd Paul the 6 when they were bringing about their modernist revolution in the church not one thing she never criticized them ever so that's a big that's a big she attended the new mass and you know from the pictures that we get from 2000 in which she very awkwardly uh, takes communion from John Paul II, it's clear from that event that she was used to taking communion in the hand. Because, and this is from a woman who received communion from an angel at Fatima. It's, and, and was told by the angel how she should approach the Blessed Sacrament. And she instead, you know, uh, receives it and seems to want to receive it in the hand. And then immediately after John Paul II sticks it in her mouth, you know, almost in a very awkward kind of way, uh, she grabs his hand and starts kissing it. As if this is the proper approach for anyone receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, you wouldn't act in this way. And not only did she do that, but she asked her bodyguard if she could stand near John Paul II after she had received communion. No one pre-New Mass, pre-New Church would ever think of receiving communion that way. There's no way the woman that you see in the pictures of Sister Lucy prior to 19, pre-1960 would ever receive communion that way. There's, I challenge you to say otherwise, any of our viewers. Now, how does this situation you've just explained, how would that, how would that affect the third secret? Well, see, that's, that's the interesting point. I'm wondering if the whole substitution was because of the third secret, ultimately. Because, um, and Father Gruner, Nicholas Gruner, used to always talk about this. Um, he cited Cardinal Chappi, who had seen the third secret. Cardinal Chappi said the third secret was about the apostasy in the church coming from the very top. And, well, that's interesting. <laughs> If that's what the third secret's about, the apostasy in the church coming from the very top, uh, that's a big difference from, you know, the third secret being about an assassination attempt against, you know, John Paul II in 1982. Um, so because, and because of this, and, and you know, Eddie, that Cardinal Bertone, uh, in 2000, went to Coimbra with a, a folder, uh, envelope holding what he said was the third secret and showing it the envelope that the real Sister Lucy had written on and showing that envelope and saying, is this yours? You know, because we want you to testify that what we're coming forward with is the real third secret. And they have, they filmed it, and he's there, Colonel Bertoni, and then uh, Sister Lucy's there, and she says, yes, this is my writing, this is the real secret. Um, so they dragged her out again in 2000, when she was supposed to be 92 years old, to testify that this was the real secret, that this was really her writing. So they continue to use her even to the very end. And um, 
But if the, if the true secret was about the apostasy in the church coming from the very top, citing Cardinal Chiappi, well then we, we sort of can understand why it's important to get rid of the real sister Lucy exactly. and to put in someone who's going to say exactly what the modern Vatican wants said and um, to distract everyone's attention because basically the important thing is that when that supposed fullness of the third secret was revealed in 2000, basically they said, it, well, this is done. It was about an assassination attempt. It was, be, it was about persecution under the communists when that was really the material of the second secret of Fatima, the persecution of, of, because of communism. Um, you know, that, it was all in the past. It doesn't have anything to do with now. That was nice, but we're going to move on. And, and, the, and the substitute, Sister Lucy, said, yes, that's the case. And she even clapped when, um, you know, the, it was announced that the third secret was going to be released and some of the content uh, in 2000, it was announced and she was there. If the real third secret is about apostasy in the church coming from the very top, that makes sense. <laughs> then it makes sense to get rid of the woman who knew that that was the secret. Because then many more Catholics could be enlightened and made aware of the fact that something was going on, that there was a great apostasy that was coming to the world after 1960, and to take account of that and to respond to it that knowledge is sort of limited to a very small numbers now, small percentage of the total baptized Catholic world. So they succeeded in what they intended to do. What's, the task of Sister Lucy Truth is to present the objective facts to try to counteract that false narrative. And that's what we intend to do, but we need people's support. We can't do it ourselves. So, well, thanks for uh, thank you. This thank is this so much is an important sure. part of that effort, and yeah. thanks for helping and, oh, and for this interview. Yeah.